On today's episode of the show, we identify three players primed for breakout seasons this fall for the Louisville football program. That said, stay tuned. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Happy Wednesday. Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dalton Pence. For those who aren't aware of who I am, this is my third season hosting the Locked On Louisville Podcast. I am a credential media member for Cardinal Sports Zone, also serve as a PA announcer for the university in various sports. I want to take this time to personally thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked On Global Podcast is free and available on all streaming services five days a week, your team, every day. On today's episode of the show, we are identifying the three players that I feel like are most primed for breakout seasons this upcoming fall for the Louisville football team. We have one offensive player, two defensive players. um, And without further ado, let's discuss our first player. We'll start on the offensive side of the football. Now, I guess let me preface this episode by telling you that it goes without saying that these aren't the only three players primed for breakout seasons. You could go many different directions with this, different routes, And I probably wouldn't even disagree with you because I feel like that is just a testament to how well Jeff Brom not only has brought great players in via the portal, but the roster retention has been incredible too. That's sort of been an unspoken trend that we haven't given enough credit, in my opinion. Louisville hasn't really lost a ton of huge contributors from last season, but For the parameters and the qualifications for this episode, primed for a breakout season, Um, I guess you could apply it to incoming transfers. It really wouldn't matter if you did or not. But for the sake of my hypothetical, I guess it just worked out to the point to where the three players that we're going to talk about are all returning players. So I I won't ramble on any longer. The first player that I feel like is primed for a breakout season is running back Maurice Turner. Turner, in his freshman season back in 2022, carried the ball 65 times for 314 yards, averaged about five yards per carry, didn't have uh, a single touchdown to his name. But when uh, Tyon Evans dealt with injury, Jalen Mitchell was um, banged up, and then Travion Cooley also was hurt. The coaching staff turned to Jawar Jordan and Maurice Turner to um, to respond in the running back room. Now, Jawar Jordan, the rest was history. He went on to have a breakout 2023 season. I went on record from April to August that I felt like Jawar Jordan was going to be a 1,000-yard rusher. And even though he spent most of the season hurt, he accomplished that goal. Now, I'm not saying that I am smarter than anyone else, or am I? No, I'm, I'm just playing. Um, but when the opportunity came in 2022, Jordan made the most out of it. The same could be said for Maurice Turner. But Maurice Turner obviously playing, you know, sort of second fiddle at that point. It wasn't expected for him to be, you know, the go-to guy in 23. But when the Cardinals got the commitment from Isaac Garendo and he ended up being sort of the backup running back, Maurice Turner had to then be sort of the third back in the equation. Jawar Jordan had the breakout season. Isaac Garendo had double-digit rushing touchdowns. I mean, he had a great year as well. And Maurice Turner took a step back in production. He had 62 carries, 284 yards. He did have a touchdown, but he took a little bit of a step back in carries and rushing yards and rushing yards per attempt. Now, he still averaged 4.6 yards per carry, which is pretty close to that 4.8. However, I expect this season to be a breakout year for the 5'10 native from Georgia. He did see a little bit of an uptick in receiving, and with Tyler Shuck leading the Cardinals offense, I think that you might see those numbers remain similar. I think you have a better um, overall 
skill position group, tight end wise, um, running back, it's up in the air. Wide receiver wise, I, I do think it's very comparable, if not better, than last season's. But Turner is going to be given an opportunity to show that he can be the lead back. Now, he's going to have to contend for carries. It's not going to be a situation where he is receiving 85% of the carries for the Cardinals because you have Miami transfer Don Chaney Jr. You have Keewan Brown returning. Isaac Brown and Duke Watson are extremely talented, true freshmen being introduced to the mix. But there's no Penny Boone. And Penny Boone was projected to be the starter at the very worst second string. I know the reports is that, you know, he was a little bit further down the depth chart where Penny Boone probably was going to be the starter. You can sort of read between the lines there. But now there is no Penny Boone. So the carry share has to go somewhere, and it's probably going to be uh, divided amongst the rest of the group. But I think that you're going to see the bulk of that um, – sent over to not only Cheney, but Maurice Turner. And I know that we keep talking about Cheney as, oh, he he's going to be the guy. I would caution those to believe that just yet because I think that you are severely overlooking Maurice Turner. Now, Turner, when his name has been called, rose to the occasion this past year, uh, ran extremely hard, only being five foot ten. That's the thing about it is – People were cool. People were um, concerned about Jawar Jordan's size. They wondered, well, can a player of his stature be a lead back in the ACC? He showed that he could do so. Five foot ten, one hundred and eighty-five pounds. Maurice Turner, five foot ten, one hundred and ninety pounds. Does he have that top end speed that Jordan had? Potentially not. I would argue that he is every bit as shifty and agile as Jordan was. I'm not sure if he is as fast. Then again, I'm not sure of the exact numbers. He very well could be. He plays extremely quick. He bounces between the tackles efficiently, and he runs very, very hard, especially between the tackles. And I've been impressed with his ability to run between the hash marks. This past season, he didn't have but one game over – 50 rushing yards. That was the game against Pittsburgh. Jawar Jordan was hurt. Louisville really couldn't throw the ball because it was a monsoon. He had 12 carries for 81 yards, average about seven yards per carry. After that, or even before that, there was only one other game where he got double digit carries and really wasn't that good of a game. 11 for 33 against USC. He had two for 41 against. Miami, he didn't log a single carry against Kentucky. Um, if you're looking for the statistics to back it up here, probably not going to. It's it's all about projection and convincing yourself that he's going to take that next step forward. I saw what I saw the year prior. He had um, some pretty encouraging performances, in my opinion. Now, 15 of 59 isn't really going to jump off the page against NC State, but he had 31 for 160, 5.2 yards per carry in the Wasabi Fenway Bowl against Cincinnati. Maybe what's holding you back from considering Turner to be a breakout candidate is you're sort of unclear about what the expectations are for being a breakout candidate. Like what constitutes a breakout? Well, if you look, it's all context-based. You look at the statistics that jo- or that Turner has had. He's had no season with over four hundred and I'm sorry, three hundred and fourteen yards. I think he's going to double his career high. So my one of my hot takes is that he's going to get over six hundred and fifty rushing yards this season. Is that a breakout candidate? I would argue that it is, all context considered. It's going to be a balanced backfield. Don Chaney is going to get some carries. Isaac Brown is going to get some carries. Keewan Brown is going to get some carries. And Louisville, in my opinion, is going to throw the football more. Tyler Shuck is, if he can stay healthy, is more of a pass-friendly quarterback than Jack Plummer was. You're going to be able to open up the offense a little bit more. And I think that you're going to spread the ball around accordingly. So the numbers might not jump off the page. Like I'm not saying he's going to be a thousand yard rusher, but I think he's going to show that he can be a very good focal point of a 
solid one-two punch in the ACC. Is he going to lead the Cardinals in rushing? I think he will. I think Turner will lead the Cardinals in rushing. I don't think he's going to lead them in rushing touchdowns because I think Cheney will probably get the uh, majority of the goal line work. But I think with the opportunity, knowing this offense already, this is his second year in a Jeff Brom offense, you can't discount another season of the college workout program. I think he takes a huge step forward here. Is he Jawar Jordan? No, he's not. But can he fill the lead back role for the Cardinals this season? I think that answer is yes, I do. Some people aren't as high on um, his ability to be a home run threat. Uh, I personally do not agree with that viewpoint. I think that he can be. And I think that you've seen plays that have exhibited that um, ability to do just that. So Maurice Turner, there, there's a couple different players that you could go with on the offensive side of the ball. I was contemplating going back and forth between Chris Bell. Jamari Johnson was right there. Um, I think Jaleel Skinner was a player that I, I thought about. But for me, I'm going to go with Maurice Turner. I think that he is the top um, offensive player primed for a breakout season. We now go to the defensive side of the ball where our next uh, player to discuss was and perhaps is the brightest young star on the defense. We'll tell you who that is here momentarily after we discuss the advantages of our friends over at FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL. FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150, bucks in, 150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, prayer, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. The Boston Celtics have made me a good amount of money this, this playoffs. Uh, my guy Shane Young at Forbes Sports told me bet the house on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, all playoffs. I've done that, and I've made some big-time money. Go to FanDuel.com and look at those odds. Choose the ones best for you, and join me in making money. Once again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. Man, I, I, it seems like I'm just tripping up over my words and I'm indecisive on what words I want to use. And even though I'm looking at a script, but if you want to take things a little bit more off script, I know that a lot of people are still you know, watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day. But if you find yourself having to constantly turn down the volume with all the shouting, you need to make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day. The bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. The brightest young star on the defense, in my opinion, is Stan Quan Clark. And he is the second player that we're going to talk about as being one primed for a huge breakout season. Stan Quan last year, statistically, nothing's going to jump off the page. The six foot three native of Miami, Florida, had 15 total tackles. Eight of those were solo. He had one forced fumble. He appeared in, I believe, close to 10 games. He never had more than three tackles in a single game. Had the forced fumble against Murray State in a 56-0 blowout at Cardinal Stadium in the home opener. Is he really the player that we think he can be? The simple answer and the very clear answer is 100% yes. Clark was a player all last offseason as he was an early enrollee. I was told by members of the program that the guy is a stud. And it was just a matter of time. You know, once he gets down to this, once he, you know, gets familiar with the speed of ACC ball, that he's going to rise to start. Excuse me. He's going to rise to start him. He had points of the season to where I felt like you saw 
some highlights of that potential. But he played behind some guys like TJ Quinn and Jalen Alderman and uh, Antonio Watts and other inside linebackers that deserve to play as well. There's only so many spots on a 4-2-5 base defensive package. I know some were wondering if Clark was going to be an outside linebacker, but it's clear that his future within this university is on the inside. Jalen Alderman has transferred away. Yes, you have Geronte Davis, and I think Geronte Davis is going to play a key role in this Cardinal defense. However, I think it's going to be in a depth spot because I think Stan Kwan is going to start alongside TJ Quinn in the Cardinals' front seven. One thing that we forget as fans of the sport is that of all the positions out there, especially on the defense, middle linebacker is perhaps one of, if not the toughest one to internalize and to get comfortable with, especially for players transitioning from more edge rusher backgrounds to being traditional every down, you know, inside linebackers or mics. It's challenging. It's not easy. But being six foot three, 230 pounds, the people that I've talked to, Brian Smith, Locked On Podcast Network, National Recruiting Analyst, told me that he was appalled that Clark was able to leave the state without the other programs refusing to let him leave the Sunshine State. He is that good. Louisville had to win the recruiting battle at the end, and they secured his uh, signature on National Signing Day, or early signing day, I should say. And the conversation was introduced pretty soon after that. And I didn't really know how he was going to be deployed, whether he was going to be more of an outside linebacker in the Leo role because he's a solid pass rusher or playing more so inside. And I think that Clark, knowing that he's more of an inside linebacker now, has a year under his belt of ACC experience. He's played in the majority of the games this past season. He has another college offseason under his belt. There's continuity with the coaching staff. I think Stan Quan Clark is a sideline to sideline, every down inside the linebacker. Is he going to be the leader of the Cardinals linebacking core? No, he's not. That's going to be for TJ Quinn. But I think that. He possesses the highest ceiling and the most potential of perhaps anyone on this defense not named Quincy Riley or Ashton Gelati. That is some very, very high praise. I don't just throw that out there lightly or even make it out to be hyperbolic. That is my true assessment of the level of talent that he has. And now having another year in this system, be more comfortable with what he's asked to do. The common misconception with players developing is that we get so caught up in statistical numbers and box score uh, production levels from years prior that we don't understand that you know sometimes it takes players a little bit longer to develop, especially those at the inside linebacker spot. It's the same for players at quarterback. Sometimes it takes a year or maybe even a couple years for players to develop. Developmental clocks are very different for every player and factoring in the context factoring in the need at linebacker like linebacker is not the deepest position personnel wise on the team you lost jackson hamilton you lost keith brown you lost jaylen alderman you did bring in geronte davis you brought in um dan i think it's dan scott um drawing a little bit of a blank on this and i do apologize for that um but why am i drawing a blank there I, i'll remember it here momentarily don't don't listen to what i have to say um but i think it's actually dan foster i'm for some reason drawing a blank but you get what i'm saying here is that you have um a lot of question marks surrounding the depth at the it is Dan Foster Jr. And my apologies to Dan, Dan Foster, not Dan Scott. He's projected to be a depth piece as well. I think Stan Quan will definitely double those numbers. I think he's probably going to be closer to about 50 tackles this year. And that's pretty good considering the defensive line that Louisville has, the players that are going to be involved in the mix. 
it would not surprise me to see him at that 50 tackle threshold. Ultimately, I am extremely excited to see what he can do this season. Is he going to be a all ACC caliber player? I think that that's more so geared towards year three, but I do think he breaks out onto the scene in year two. Now, a player that um, also has the ability to break out in his second season with the Cardinals is, I'll tell you here coming up momentarily. Before we do that, I do want to thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, Locked On Mobile is free on all streaming services five days a week, your team every day. Um, just a reminder that the Locked On Mobile podcast is going into off-season mode for June and July. What does that mean for program scheduling? All it means is that we go from 19 monthly episodes down to 12 or 13. So no five a day, um, you know, five a week episodes, more so three to four, depending on um, the amount of uh, information that is out there. News will start to slow down. So if you have any questions that you want answered, you want any topics covered, I will be very, very receptive to open IDs. You can drop them in the comments below, or you can reach out to my Twitter at DPITS underscore. I've already seen some comments that are um, offering up some topics that we will discuss here in the next week heading into um, the fall. But just a heads up, so don't get too um, don't get too confused if you see that we aren't having five episodes a week. But nonetheless, it's not June just yet. We have a little bit of May still left. To conclude today's episode, we identified the last player primed for a breakout season in the class with the um, – with the guy we just talked about, Stan Quan Clark, Adonijah Green was, depending on what recruiting service you utilized, the highest rated player in the Flyville 23 class that featured players like Pierce Clarkson, Aaron Williams, Stan Quan Clark, you name it, Madden Sanker. The list goes on extremely star studded class. Same thing with Adonijah Green and Stan Quan Clark. The statistical numbers really weren't there. Three total tackles last season, one assisted, two solo. That was it. The opportunity is there. Now, Ashton Gelati is back. I think that that works to a player like Adonijah Green's benefit because right now the Leo spot is wide open. That was going to be Tyler Barron's spot. He ended up transferring again. You bring in players like Miles Jernigan, Richard Kenley, uh, Tramel Logan, three players that will be in contention for that outside linebacker or overall edge rushing depth potential starter. Adonijah Green has one season in this collegiate system, in this team, in this program. And again, you can't discount how much assistance can be offered with another year of collegiate development. With Stan Quan Clark, I was also told that Adonijah Green was a player to focus on in the spring. The six foot six, 225 pound native of Ellenwood, Georgia, didn't really get a ton of opportunity last year. Stephen Heron, uh, Mason Riger. Speaking of Mason Riger, again, it is sort of a Interesting subject at the moment. We want to respect the privacy, but at this point, it seems like we don't know the status of Mason Riger's injury. I will call it. I'm not necessarily so sure what it is. We're not going to speculate. The only thing we're going to address is that at the moment, there is uncertainty as to how much he's going to play, if he's going to play at all. Is it going to be where he only plays like so much a game? Who knows? You don't have Tyler Barron. You lose some guys that were backing up at the edge rushing spots over the past couple of seasons in the transfer portal this offseason. Even if he's not starting, Green will be, a, will be a great pass rushing specialist. But I do think that if you made me choose who I believe will start at the other edge rushing spot, I think it is going to be Adonijah Green. In high school, he showed that level of pursuit, that explosiveness off the edge, but it was a matter of just adding some more weight, 
to my understanding, he's added about 20 pounds of muscle between his freshman season and now, which is great. You love to see that, um, getting his body right, transforming his frame, getting to a spot to where he's able to play every down or a good amount of downs at the ACC level. A breakout for him, statistically, is not going to be hard to achieve. I think I'm going to go out on a limb here. And if you look at the Louisville football stats from the uh, past couple of seasons, more specifically in 2023, you look at the sack numbers, right? Ashton Gelati led the team with 11. Riger had five. Ramon Perrier, who's back, had four. Jared Dawson with two and a half. Des Tell with two. I think that Adonijah Green will have, let's just say, where could you go with this? Let's say 15 tackles and over four sacks. I think that that's a reachable and reasonable number to throw out there. Now, granted, edge rusher, the, the tackle numbers aren't going to be off the charts. Ashton Gelati is on the team, and he is going to be the best player in the ACC, one of, if not the best edge rusher in the country. He will get the majority of the sacks, but there is opportunity opposite of him to exploit mismatches with an offensive line that is focused on stopping one man. Now, granted, what can also help is you have a guy by the name of Thor Griffith in the middle of that interior defensive line and couple him with Des Tell and Jared Dawson. And then you also throw Ramon Perrier into the mix, Jordan Gerard, the Florida International slash Minnesota transfer. And Green has the opportunity to, I won't say sneak up on opposing defenses because I think that that's um, – you know, sort of a, a bad way to put it, but you take the or you take advantage of the opportunity of teams not throwing their best offensive linemen your way. And I'm really excited to see what this means for his potential. I think his potential is through the roof. It's a matter of getting the reps. It's a matter of transforming his body and now getting the opportunity to put that on full display. The thing about predicting breakout seasons is that there has to be projection. There has to be a level of optimism because I'm not going to project a player who's already like a huge contributor to just be a breakout player. They already are breakout players. It's about projection. So my question to you all listening, who do you think are going to be the players primed the most for breakout seasons for the Cardinals? Drop a comment in the comment section below, um, tweet it out on Twitter, whatever your preferred um, platform is. But that is going to wrap up today's episode of the show. We'll be back here tomorrow to discuss some.